Hello, everyone. Welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Andrew Stokels. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Future City Lab podcast. Today, we're joined by Saskia Kulaga. Saskia is a researcher here with the uh, Cognition Perception Behavior Group, and she is studying how users, specifically usually pedestrians uh, in cities, uh, perceive their environment and perceive the interior environment of buildings, and also how can we design buildings to better accommodate users' needs and the needs of different population groups. So uh, thank you, Saskia, for joining us today. Hello. Welcome. Um, so you came to uh, Singapore um, previously, you were in uh, Europe, but um, you were also studying the Seattle Public Library. Um, this is in, obviously, Seattle and designed by Rem Koolhaas, the famous architect. So this building and studying it got you interested in this topic of wayfinding. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and why this building generated uh, this interest from you? Hmm. First, let me clarify that um, with wayfinding, we mean not the philosophical way through life. Um, <laughs> which is also <laughs> equally important. <laughs> <laughs> which is also equally important, but what we mean is the cognitive process. So um, what decisions do you make when you navigate from A to B? What information do you see in the environment? How do you use that information to find a good way or to find shortcuts? And then when you are at the destination, how do you actually see that that's the correct destination that you desired? So that's a bit about the background of what wayfinding is. And then in the literature, we found that an architectural critique, Kim Dove had said that the Seattle Public Library is one of the most disorienting buildings uh, one can imagine, according to him. And thus, we were very interested in what makes this building tricky for people. And we analyzed social media comments and they actually confirmed that. So there was one person who actually said that she got an anxiety attack, so she didn't know how to get out of the building. And that's why we conducted a wayfinding study. So what were certain aspects of the building that made it so intimidating to people? I think in general, this building, um, and it has been designed in 2004, so quite some time ago, has misaligned floor plates. Um, so the layout is not the same in between different floors. Um, it has unidirectional elevators that skip a floor. Um, or in all of the things it does, it's visually highly interesting and has like, for example, one totally red store uh, floor. And um, these aspects make that you on the one hand like have this visual aesthetics that almost overwhelm you, while on the other hand, you do not have an efficient point-to-point -point wayfinding. So, in a sense, they designed this building to be novel and unique, but they also missed out on responding to what people might actually want or might actually be better for people in a building. It is breaking the mental scheme or the mental image that we may have about how a library should look like. Mm. It is very innovative in terms of its design. And um, for people who are looking for this efficient way of finding, um, they may get some challenges. For example, in one task, we asked them to find non-fiction DVDs and they went to a floor with fiction DVDs, but that was an entirely different, uh, like an entirely wrong floor as well as a subsection. So we have a spatial error and a semantic error. And for us, that's highly interesting because how can architects um, before they build a building, anticipate what users will do in this building, what challenges they will have, and what strategies, and so on. And it sounds like, from what you were telling me earlier, that everyone actually, when they enter a certain type of building, they come with their expectations based on previous buildings they've been to that are similar. Yeah, I would say that. So um, in that way, the Seattle Public Library um, has a different semantic organization and spatial organization and you may not find the destinations where you expect them. And because of that, you may initially have a strategy that doesn't work to find a location, wander around endlessly. And if you're not allowed to ask anybody, like researchers then do, um, you may actually have serious detours. 
And coming back to the quote that some people have anxiety attacks, I think that's um, almost what we call a, usa a, yeah, a building usability problem. Mm -hmm. So something is not entirely uh, smooth with the way people interact with this building mm. for some people. So for right. others um, who go there leisurely, who want to get lost in right. the library, of course, that's a different story. Right. So how did you end up in Singapore, Saskia? And uh, when we think about complex cities, especially those in Asia, which have a lot higher density than those in, say, North America or Europe, um, how do those issues then compound to the scale of the city and uh, beyond, actually? Okay. Yeah, actually, the scalability is one point, because in the Seattle Public Library, you talk about one multi-level building, obviously. Yeah. And there we figured out that what we term one size does not fit all. So you have to plan for diverse needs of users. And one thing I was particularly interested in are elderly people. And Singapore is unique in this case because they have this active aging approach. So okay. we look at a generation of seniors who are highly active. They want to venture out. They want to experience public spaces. And our question from the Cognition Perception Behavior Group then is, how do we actually um, help architects and planners, um, or support them, help is not the right word, to um, adapt cities for pedestrian comfort and for the different needs of these different user groups? Okay, so in Singapore there's this building, Kampong Admiralty, which was designed uh, to allow this aging in place, allow people to access services all in their immediate vicinity. So in your view, has this been successful? What are some of the things that need to be considered when you do this approach? Yeah, in general, I think it has been highly successful because it has won several prizes. Um, it's a multifunctional compound, so you have um, a supermarket and doctors and different generations. The elderly can do a lot of volunteering for younger people and in general, as such, I would think it's a very good approach. On the other hand, it's in Woodlands, so it's in the north. While it has a direct connection to the city via MRT, um, I think that it would be worth to look into um, options about designing the public places in the city center to be more adapted to these needs of elderly users. And that's what we're interested in. And so it's not just having everything close by, but it's actually the way in which places are laid out in uh, connective networks and uh, pedestrian network networks, is that right? That's true, because the experience that you may have in one space is dependent on a lot of factors, on things that are on the side of the individual, of you, and of the building side. And on top of that, in Singapore, we have a high density, so we have the social environment as well. And our interest is then in um, the complex buildings with the additional layer of the environment, uh, of the social environment, and the specific needs of certain users. So when you take the MRT in the morning or the bus, and you arrive at a place, um, how do you find your way in in different density conditions? So when there are many people around, or not so many people around. So Saskia, you mentioned this building, uh, Camping Admiralty, that in your opinion has been successful, uh, but this is one building as well. So. It allows people to access services conveniently in their neighborhood, which is important for people who have less mobility. Um, but there's also the idea, the goal, that cities should allow the elderly and actually all populations to be able to access more of the city and actually get out and see different areas and have that accessibility across the city. So how do you ensure that um, going from the building to actually the scale of the city? That's a very good question. Um, I guess um, some of your points are if you design residential areas that are already doing so well, what need would there be to go to the city and experience those environments as well? And to some extent that is right, because from the interviews I've had with elderly during my wayfinding study, they said as well that they have favorite places where they go to, and that is usually because they are familiar with that, and because it's not so crowded, and because um, some of the shops there may be more interesting to them, whereas in the city, many shops are interesting for younger generations. Um, so I think that the approach should, and partially that's in guidelines that we would have to find, should be to have um, something beyond universal design planning, so that we're on the one hand looking at individuals, 
and on the other hand at groups and also to scale it up indeed to the city and to not only look at one park or one residential area, one neighborhood, uh, one transportation area and MRT station, but the whole connection of several buildings and areas in the city. And so the idea is not to isolate the elderly into specific places, but actually to integrate them into more parts of the city. Yeah, I mean, this is, of course, a top-down um, language that we're currently using. Mm. Ideally, it would be the other way around, so that mm. they would be motivated by themselves to mm. venture out because the city is so interesting. Mm. And some things that are currently standing a bit in the way is that elderly in Singapore avoid crowded places. So is there a way to make um, crowded environments more comfortable to them? Um, another thing is that sometimes, um, for example, large-scale multi-level shopping malls are designed to keep you inside, mm. whereas then elderly have trouble finding back the car park or um, the MRT station. Um, this is due to the different needs that elderly have because there is sensorial decline, there is um, cognitive decline. Um, elderly can, for example, deal less well than younger people with visual clutter in the environment. And that's one of the upcoming studies we have to see to what extent does density, social density, on top of everything else, a complex environment and so on, individual factors and so on, influence how much comfort we perceive? So um, it's easy to say that we should design for the elderly. Everyone can agree that that's a good uh, idea and it's also becoming more important because aging populations are more and more the norm in Asia and Europe and in fact everywhere um, increasingly. So. How do you do that? How do you design for a specific population? And uh, do you even have to think about it that way? Is designing only for the elderly or are you actually accomplishing something larger? Of course, I think you would always try to reach everybody. You would try to reach mothers who have strollers, wheelchair users, elderly, uh, the youth, differently aged workers and so on. So in that sense, you want to have something that fits for all and at the same time what I'm saying is also contradictory because you don't want to have something that is generic. In that sense you must have an infrastructure that exists in a city and public places need to be interesting for different kinds of users and this interest is on the one hand experiential and on the other hand, behavioral interaction. So efficient wayfinding there would be the core of everything because if you can't find your way out of such a complex building in case of an emergency, for example, extreme situation, then you're lost for good. Right. So that's and that discourages people from even going outside if they feel intimidated. Well, if they can't outside. understand the space, so if the space is illegible or not, creating a nice experience. For elderly specifically, that's um, good signage, mm. which in Singapore is not trivial because we have so many different languages and cultures. Um, the exits have to be clearly marked. There shouldn't be any bumpy roads and curbs on the street because they're afraid of falling. They're also afraid of um, younger people um, jostling and uh, falling. Um, unfamiliar places are a bit tricky. Then um, what Singapore does quite well is the, that there are many seating areas and refreshment places and restrooms. And on top of that, you have seldom long distances, which would also be a factor of hindrance for elderly. But coming back to the question, um, of course, you would like to design something, a city, a future city, so to speak, that works for everybody and is still interesting. So you don't want to have a boring city, which is super legible. There should be some mystery and some, ex some excitement. But you also want to have, you don't want to have an illegible place because then people may get um, anxiety attacks <laughs> in the Seattle Public Library or avoid the mm. place as sometimes in Singapore and other places worldwide happens. Right. Well, that's all very uh, fascinating information, Saskia. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, in kind of in conclusion, how do you make this a reality? How do architects, designers, people who are planning cities, how do we all contribute to designing age-friendly cities? For me, as a researcher, the most crucial point would be research translation. So oftentimes the publications that we write are having statistics and a certain way of wording and so on. And how do we actually 
have designers and architects and planners, urban planners, um, who can read that, understand that. So for me there, it is a political thing. We need an active conversation between practitioners and researchers. And that's, I think, one thing that Future Cities Laboratory is doing already and will be doing. And for building evaluations, we need an iterative process. So we not only can do post-occupancy evaluations, where we go to existing places and see, okay, what goes well, what doesn't go so well, but we also need pre-occupancy evaluations where within the design process you constantly evaluate the places from the user perspective. One aspect in there is of course participatory design or co-design um, and the other one is what tools and methods do we need to bring the user's perspective into planning and also into guidelines for future generations. Um, I think one thing that our group, for example, does is uh, working closely together with URA and local architectural offices. Mm. And that is one way of bringing psychology, spatial cognition, cognitive research and so on directly into planning practice so that hopefully together we can all work on making the city, the building, depending on the scale, an efficient, effective, and pleasant place, and then hopefully for everybody. And this is um, worldwide something that um, researchers like us would like to do. And in Singapore, it has the additional topic also about the land scarcity and density. Mm. So to sum up, I think um, we need iterative evaluations that bring the user perspective into the design planning practice, and we need a lot of interdisciplinary collaborations and conversations that could influence guidelines and future buildings. Great. Well, thank you so much for that, Saskia. It's really fascinating, and we hope that your work is, in fact, translated and uh, impacts the way we all live and work in cities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.